thank you so much. Please be seated. It really is an incredible honor. Thank you, Phil and Lucinda, for inviting me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really expected. I'm getting comp lost in my iPad here. Here we go. Um, I'm really expecting that God is going to do something tonight. I mean, today. And um, yeah, my, my heart as a counselor is to always see people not just come to places of healing and wholeness but to start to live in the fullness of what we were created for. And that's the kind of motivation that I'm gonna be speaking into as we end this series, What's Love Got To Do With It? And I'm gonna be looking into brave love. And I know sometimes we need brave love because life is not always easy. I know what it feels like to be portrayed and hurt and rejected and to fail. Many, many years ago, when I was in my late teens, many years ago, um, I experienced a huge betrayal. I never had a good relationship with my mom growing up. And um, uh, back in the day, there was this uh, competition on Mnet. It was back in the days when I think there were only six channels. Uh, anybody remember those days? And um, I had watched this, this series, and um, in this competition, you had to phone in and give the answer to this question, and I knew the answer. Um, I never had access to a phone back then, so I asked my mom to phone in. Uh, she wouldn't allow me to use the phone. It was a complicated story. And um, anyway, long story short, we ended up winning these two return tickets to London. And uh, the cost of the flight was three and a half thousand rand. I think that's the flight to Cape Town now, never mind to London. And uh, I was really excited. I thought this was going to be a great opportunity for us to, to travel together and maybe find some kind of reconciliation in our relationship. And uh, because the ticket was in her name, she ended up inviting one of her best mates and not me. And I was absolutely heartbroken. I was devastated. It was one of like these deep wounds. And it's so easy in these moments to just want to move into revenge and retaliation. And I remember talking to a mentor of mine and he said, you know what? God's all about restoration and forgiveness and reconciliation. These are the tools of the kingdom. And he said, you know, you can choose to go into revenge and retaliation, or you can choose to push into God. And that's my hope for us, because everyone's got some kind of a story, don't we? We've all got stories where we've been victims to other people's behaviors that have wounded us and impacted us. Or maybe that was your story. Something you chose to do impacted somebody else's life. And the reality is the difference between being a victim and a victor is not circumstances, it's choice. It's how we choose to respond in these moments that in a sense start to create a different culture. We start to kind of in a sense reveal what it means to fully understand what it means to, um, to, to be loved by God. And, and so I wanna speak into the space because in the counseling room, I hear story after story after story of hurt and pain and betrayal and failure and rejection. But I also know that we serve a God that has a better way, that we can break cycles. And that's what I wanna speak into. So I wanna give you some lenses so that we can process these spaces in a healthier way. I wanna help you understand the big picture, the problem from a big picture perspective. We're gonna look at some solution lenses to the space and then how do we apply this to our own lives? How do we start to draw lines in the sand and say, I'm gonna to choose today to respond in a different spirit with brave love. So I wanna speak first of all into the difference between heart wounds and physical wounds. You see, as I said before, all of us have experienced pain or hurt. Now, if you have a physical injury, let's say you've dislocated your shoulder and someone comes up and gives you a hug and squeezes you on the arm, that pain is gonna cause you to react. Generally, the person who sees you reacting is gonna understand that you're in physical pain and so they'll have a level of empathy and, and understanding to your response. But when it comes to our hearts, we can't see the injuries. And so often when a person responds out of their pain in their heart, we retaliate back. As the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. 
And most of us at some space in our hearts have got wounds beneath the surface. When I do marriage counseling, I always have this picture of, you know, sometimes we're walking in the journey of relationships and as you're engaging in conversation, suddenly you hear this click. It's like a landmine beneath the surface and then there's a, you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes there's a 10 rand trigger, but a thousand rand response. It's because you've stepped on some kind of a fear or insecurity or rejection or wound or trauma or unmet expectation. And we need to start to understand that if we're just gonna react back, then we just add to the cycle. Instead of choosing to respond, instead of choosing to press pause and go, something's going on beneath the surface of your heart, what is it? Help me understand. So we need to understand the difference between heart wounds and physical wounds. But most of our woundedness comes actually from unmet crucial needs. There are three crucial needs that every single human being is striving for. Am I loved? Do I have purpose? And what is my value? These needs ultimately come from our relationship with God, knowing that God is love, we're made in His image, God placed us here with an intentionality and a purpose. And God says, you know what? It's not good for us to be alone. We were created for relationship. It gives us a sense of value. Now these three needs, even though they originated in the heart of God, were born into a broken world. So our starting point is no longer security, significance, and self-worth, but a striving to get the thirsts of our heart met. Now, A deeper problem is that we all have broken processing. And here's what I mean by this. You see, we're born into a world that is fallen, fickle, fragile, and fallible. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned. There's no perfect spouse, there's no perfect parents, there's no perfect kids. But what we do is that when we experience pains and hurts and rejections, especially when we're children, a child doesn't go, you know, something wrong with my mom. I think they should be in counseling. Like they need to go to parenting classes. A child doesn't do that. What a child does is that it absorbs the dysfunction into their identity. There's something wrong with me. For years, that was my narrative. I couldn't understand why I was going through what I was going through with my mom. I didn't understand that she had broken hurts and insecurities in her heart that was spilling over onto me. I just absorbed it into who I was. My identity became there's something wrong with me. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I grew up, I put the ways of childhood behind me. But most people still live their lives believing many of the beliefs that they had about themselves in childhood as they moved into adulthood. And so they're perpetuating the cycle. If there's something wrong with me, I'm gonna live as if there's something wrong with me. I'm gonna react as if there's something wrong with me. And so as we start to believe these lies, we also need to understand that there are schemes against us. Schemes that wanna keep us in brokenness, keep us from living in the fullness of our identity. Ephesians 6, 11 says to put on God's armor so that we can stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Do you know what his strategies are? How are we gonna fight the good fight if we're not aware of how he tries to take us down? John 8, 44 talks about how he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding on to truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. That doesn't mean he's kind of average at lying. He's really good at it. And again, here's one of the biggest schemes of the enemy. Every time you go through any kind of experience or rejection or even failure, he's gonna get you to believe that your identity, your value equals what you've just been through. So if somebody rejects you, it's because you are unlovable. If you fail, he's gonna say, it's because you are a failure. He wants you to personalize your experience into believing that's what you are. And then that brings shame 
into the equation. You see, shame is an identity crippling emotion. There's something wrong with me. And as we start to believe that this is the truth about who we are, we find ways to cope. We find ways to survive. In psychology, it's called self-protective mechanisms, defense mechanisms, strategies to help us cope. And I want to speak quickly into these protective strongholds. Scripture calls a defense mechanism strongholds. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 6. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. A stronghold is any behavior I choose to engage in as a means of holding safety. Any behavior that I choose to engage in as a means of holding safety. If you believe there's something wrong with you, that anything you do will just fail, then your means of holding safety is gonna be one of avoidance, or one of rejection, or one of isolation. And you see, when you start to live in the strategies and the schemes and the strongholds that the enemy wants you to live in, it's gonna make your world really small. It's going to make your potential limited. He's going to hold you back and keep you in bondage from living in the fullness of what we're created for. So I want to look at these five points of hurt, heart wounds, unmet crucial needs, broken processing, schemes against me, and protecting strongholds, and apply it to a story in Scripture. And the story is found in John 4, verses 9 to 4. I'm sorry, 4 to 9. I have dyslexia, so everything gets switched around sometimes. It's fun, just go with it, I do. <laughs> okay, so this is um, <clears throat> talking about Jesus. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to a Samaritan vo- village of Sakar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And soon, a Samaritan woman came to drink water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Why are you asking me for a drink? It's a disqualification question. You see, the story she's telling herself is there's something wrong with me because I'm just a Samaritan woman. She disqualified herself through her culture and her gender. You see, she had heart wounds. She'd been married five times and was now living with a guy. I wonder what her story was. Had there been grief and loss? Had there been rejection or betrayal? Had she failed in some kind of way? in terms of how she engaged in her relationships. There were unmet crucial needs. I imagine there was a deep longing in her heart to just be loved and accepted for who she was. And five, six relationships later, there's hurts, there's wounds. I wonder what the story was she told herself, her processing. Why is everybody else still in good relationships and I've gone through six? What's wrong with me? There were schemes against her. I imagine there was a lot of rejection she went through. Scripture talks about how she went to go draw water in the middle of the day. Most would draw in the morning or the evening when it was cool. There was a protective stronghold of isolation. You see, she chose to go into the middle of the day so she didn't have to face people. How many of you are living your lives in hiding, in revenge, in avoidance, in fear, in insecurities because you're afraid that there's something wrong with you. You're afraid that you're gonna just mess up again. You're afraid that failure is is gonna cross your path. You see, any kind of fear of rejection or failure will result in us living life very small as we hold ourselves back because we think there's something wrong with me. So how do we process this space well? How do we start to break out of these lies and schemes and strongholds? What is the solution lenses to processing this? I love the reply that Jesus gives this woman when she said, why are you asking me? He doesn't actually answer her direct. Listen to what he says in John 4 verse 10. 
Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. If only you knew. You see, truth sets us free. If you don't know what truth is, how are you gonna discern the lies? If you don't know what truth is, how are you gonna discern the lies? Jesus said to her, if only you knew who was for you, not against you, who has a plan for you, the, the power of the one that actually came to save you, that loves you, if only you knew the truth of how much Jesus loves you, if only you knew the truth of your value. You see, Jesus knows the thirst of the human heart. He put it there. He created us to be in a loving relationship with Him. He understands the thirst. The problem is, what are we turning to to get our thirsts met? Jeremiah 2 verse 13 says this. This is the prophet speaking on behalf of God. He goes, my people have committed two sins. One, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And two, they've dug for themselves their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. You see, the thirst is not condemned. It's what we turn to to get our thirst met that is the problem. We've, we've turned away from this fountain, this picture of abundant, overflowing, life-giving water, and we've turned to broken wells. A broken well is anything in creation that I turn to to try and get the thirst of my heart met. It's what I call the desserts of life. You can't eat dessert for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You'll just get sick. You see, God is our main meal, and creation is dessert. There's nothing wrong with dessert. But God wants us to find our sustenance in Him, not creation. And if there is no dessert, it's okay, because I've got my main meal. You see, I think the woman of the well was turning to self-reliance and avoidance, and maybe even relationships to meet the thirst of her heart. Jesus actually said to her, Anyone who drinks this water will soon thirst again. He was, talking to the, he was talking about the well. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up for eternal life. So my question is this, what are you drinking from? You see, when we go through hurts and betrayals and failures, often it reveals what our source is. Because if someone's rejecting you and they're your source, you're gonna really struggle. If your capacity to perform is what's causing you to fail and your identity is based in performance and you're failing, you're gonna struggle because now it's no longer meeting the need of your heart. So how do we right size our expectations? Because the reality is we live in a broken, fallen world. I want you to imagine if you're walking in a desert and you've got three more days before you get to water and there's a group of you and you're the only one left with water. There are three things people around you are gonna do to survive. The first is they're gonna use flattery. You're such an amazing, sharing, kind person. I love you, you're, 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 you're awesome, you know, you're my favorite person, like, can I have a drink of your water? They're gonna use flattery to get what they can from you. If that doesn't work, they're gonna, use, they're gonna use manipulation. I thought you were a Christian. I thought you cared about me. You know, if, if you do, then, then you'll give me your water. If that doesn't work, they'll kill you for it. That's the world we live in. We live in a world that's thirsty. And we need to right size our expectations of people. People are broken. They're looking to get the thirst of their heart met. But so many are turning to creation instead of creator. That's why people are walking around so desperately thirsty. That's why hurt people hurt people. It's not their hearts. It's their hurts. John 2, 24 to 25 talks about how Jesus, it says this, but Jesus didn't trust them, them being people, because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. You can't take it personally when someone rejects you. Often it's because of their own brokenness. 
We're all fallen, fragile, fallible people. I'm sure many of you have experienced what it's like to break an ankle or to get a twisted ankle where a body part fails us. You don't walk around going, you don't know what, my ankle, my ankle just betrayed me. It, like, it twisted on me when I was dependent on it, so now I can't even rely on it. Can you believe what my ankle did? We don't do that because we understand the frailness of our body, especially when you get over 40. Are you with me? You think you can do cartwheels, but you can't. <laughs> But here's what happens when a body part fails us. The rest of our body parts come together to support the broken parts. And scripture says we are all parts of the body. And there are broken parts in here that are gonna fail you. We need to right size our expectations of the parts. As I said, I didn't have a good relationship with a mom and many years I struggled with this because I think everyone needs a good mom in their lives. And one of the pastors of the church that I was working for in Durban, the, the senior pastor, his, his wife was one of those moms, that, one of those women that just ooze momness. You know those people that just give you like those amazing mom hugs. And I went to her one day saying, I just need a mom chat and some mom advice. And she's like, that's cool, man. And she taught me one of the most valuable lessons in life. She said, there are many days, Mads, where you're gonna come and knock on my door. And not because of my heart, but because of my capacity, I don't have what you need in the moment. And it's not because I don't love you, it's because sometimes I run empty too. And I was like, I need to find five moms. <laughs> then I've always got a mom. You see, we were not created to be dependent on a body part. My big toe can't support me forever. I need my whole body, I need my whole body to be my community, to be my support. Because hurt people hurt people, but healed people help heal people. And that's why God has created us for relationship and community and to belong to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, and you can read the whole part in terms from verse 12 to 27, talks about how every part needs every part. Community is crucial if we wanna find healing and wholeness. So I've spoken about the problem and we've looked at some lenses to help us better understand the brokenness of the world we live in and how actually we have to take ownership of our responses. So how do we apply this to our everyday living? How do, we, how do we tap into God's love so that we can have healthy relationships despite complicated emotions? How do we choose differently. Well, first of all, I believe we need to live from our source. We need to understand the identity and the authority that we have in Christ. Did you know that the root meaning of sin in the New Testament means to be without a share in? In other words, to live without inheritance, to live as an orphan instead of a son. Most people are not living from the fullness of their identity because they're still living as orphans. They don't know who they are. Ephesians 1.5 talks about how God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Christ. This is good news. From, an, from, from, a, from a, this time in, 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 in world understanding of adoption, we often see it from a negative perspective. A, a really good friend of mine was adopted when she was very, very young and she went to school one day and some punk kid came in and said to her, oh, it's because you weren't wanted. And it rocked her world. A biblical understanding of adoption means that if you're adopted, it's such a legally binding contract that it's actually an eternally binding contract, meaning you're more safe if you're adopted than if you're in your biological family. Because adoption in biblical times went beyond the grave. Nothing could break it. And God says that we've been adopted into the family. Do you know your inheritance? Do you know where you belong? Hebrews 4.16 talks about how we can boldly enter into the throne of our gracious God. Whenever I think of this phrase, I think of the concept of fridge rights. Fridge rights is when you can go into anybody's house, well, family or friends, and you can claim fridge rights. You can help yourself without asking. Do you have fridge right people in your house? They come into you and just like clear out your fridge. 
God says when we bold, we can boldly enter, we can boldly enter into his kitchen and open the fridge and help ourselves. Why? Because we belong. We sons and daughters of the king. That's our inheritance. Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Listen what happens to the Samaritan woman when she finds her source. John 4, 25 to 28. Her and Jesus have been having a long conversation about water and thirsts and wells and streams and all of this. And the woman then says to Jesus, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. I wonder what happened in that moment. Like her brain's just ticking over going, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for the one that's gonna be the answer and the solution to the thirst of my heart. And now I'm standing talking to him. Can you imagine what happened to her kind of tank of self-worth? I imagine it just went through the roof. Because remember, she disqualified herself as a Samaritan, and Jews generally had nothing to do with Samaritans. They hated Samaritans so much, they would choose intentionally to do a three-day detour around Samaria to avoid Samaritans. That's how much this culture was despised. And now a Jew, a male Jew, is talking to her and declaring that actually he's the Messiah. The revelation that happened in that moment, I believe there was a massive exchange of shame to worth. She's chosen, and she said, so I am the Messiah. I don't know if there was a big dramatic pause in real life that happened there, because then it goes on to say, it goes, just then the disciples come back, and they're shocked to find them talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want to do with her? Why are you talking to her? Again, I don't know how, what happened time-wise in that space, but this is the point I wanna make. The woman then left her water job beside the well, and she didn't walk. She ran back to the village. She ran to tell everyone. She ran to the people she had been avoiding because of her shame. You see, a revelation of Christ suddenly changes the way we respond to our shame and our insecurities and our rejections and our betrayals. We run now to the ones that betray us. And she says to them, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And it says that people came flooding to see him. You see, we're our masterpiece made for a mission. This is what brave love is all about. It leads to bold living. Bold love leads to bold living. We are God's masterpieces. They were created anew in Christ Jesus so that we can go and do good things that he planned for us long ago. Again, we have a choice to respond in revenge or retaliation to the hurts that people put in our lives, or we can start to respond with the tools of the kingdom Forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, redemption. You see, a revelation of Christ leads to liberated living. We have been called with a responsibility and given the task of reconciling people back to God. We are all Christ's ambassadors. And He is making His appeal through us. You see, I believe we're living in a time now where we need in this world messengers of hope. And a true messenger of hope sees hope even in hopeless circumstances. That's what it's all about. And I know it's not easy. That's why it's called brave love. It needs courage. And I want to just end on considering how did Jesus, in his worst night of betrayal, what, he, what, what can we learn from Jesus when he's facing the biggest betrayal of his life? How did he choose to respond when it's so incredibly painful? And I'm not gonna read the whole story. I wanna encourage you to read it. But this is the story of the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 36 to 46. It's an easy number to remember. And there are five things we can learn from Jesus when we're facing the heart of betrayal and disappointment and rejection. 
You see, it talks about how he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. The first point is sometimes when we're facing painful things, we need to find safe spaces where we can retreat. We need, to, we, need to, we, need to, we need to find those safe spaces where we can wrestle through these painful emotions. It's okay to feel what you feel. Verse 36 talks about he went to a place when he was facing extreme mental and spiritual suffering. He needed time to process what he was going through. Verse 38 talks about how he revealed, he opened up to those closest with him and he said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. You see, when we go through rejections and betrayals and hurts, sometimes we need those safe spaces where we can get emotion out. Emotion is like vomit. You can't dream of a Sunday roast when you're feeling nauseous with bitterness. We need safe spaces to get the emotion out in order for healing to happen. You see, you can't heal what you don't reveal. It's okay to feel what you feel, but own what you're feeling and manage how you respond. Then it says, he shifted his position to the place where he poured out his heart to his father. He wrestled. Wrestling is intimate. There have been many times where I've wrestled through pain and rejection and hurts and betrayals, but I've wrestled with my father because it's my father that has called me. It's my father that helps me. And in that space, God the Father helped Jesus realign to what it was that he was called for. And I'm so glad he did because that's what helped Jesus understand that he was going to the cross to die for you and me. And he repeated this process three times. And every time he went back to his disciples that he had asked to pray for him, he found them asleep. In his greatest need, people are going to let you down. But we've got to keep pushing back to the one that created us and called us. And the last step was that he rose. Verse 46, it talks about how Jesus, he says this, rise, let's go, here comes my betrayer. You see, he knew he had a calling despite the disappointments and the failures of those around him. That's why he came. John 15, 13 says, no greater love has this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And I remember when I wrestled with my mom's betrayal with my mentor, he, he spoke a word over me I've, I'll never forget. 25 years ago, he said this to me, loving people the way you were recreated to love them will cost you your life. It's one of those things you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. The only difference between a victim and a victor is not circumstances, it's choice. It's how we choose to respond. And God has given us all the tools we need and the resources we need to start to be ambassadors of hope, to bring love to a hurting and broken world. So won't you stand with me? I don't know where you're at in your journey. Maybe right now you're facing a betrayal and you're heartbroken, and you're angry, and you're revengeful, and you're bitter. Maybe you're the one that caused the betrayal, and you're full of remorse, and anguish, and self-loathing. I don't know what your story is, but I know the one that came to die for every single one of us has everything you need for reconciliation, for restoration, for redemption. And so I wanna pray for you today, wherever you're at in your journey, that today will be a day that we put a line in the sand going, I'm not gonna step into revenge and retaliation. Instead, I'm gonna to turn to my source to give me everything I need so that I can heal, so that I can love the world around me with a courage and a braveness because that's what it means to be ambassadors. That's what this world needs right now is a different response, not a revenge response. And so if you're needing a divine appointment with God this morning, why don't you just raise your hand, wherever you are, whatever, any location. Just begin to invite God into this space. And so Father, I pray for every hand raised right now, every heart that's broken, every emotion that's raging, every identity that is buckling under shame and guilt, won't you right now just pour out an abundant revelation of your love? Won't you fill the thirsts of the hearts of your sons and daughters? 
Won't you be their resource in this time of hurts and betrayal and disappointments? Jesus, won't you do an incredible work right now of healing and refilling and restoration? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you give us everything we need. And Father, I pray that you give each person right now that's wrestling courage to say, today I choose to respond differently. Today I choose to respond as a victor, not a victim. Today I choose to respond in your love. In this time and this space, just pour out to God your emotions. Wrestle with Him. Push into His heart and allow Him to do what only He can do.